Good morning, YouTube. Welcome to the Reptile Barn. Uh, quick video today, I hope. You know, I always say quick video, and then who knows if it's actually quick or not. Um, I do want to talk about something, though. I want to talk about what makes a reptile the right reptile for you. So, um, I'm going to approach this from two sides, okay? The first side is what I typically talk about, because I've addressed this before, right? Um, one side of things is kind of the get what you love, you know, go for your dream, uh, stay away from the whole starter reptile concept, don't let people talk you out of something that you're most interested in, that kind of side, okay? So we'll start there. Um... I, I'm very against people who are like, oh, if you really love, you know, water monitors, you should get an Aki monitor. That, that, what? <laughs> that doesn't make any sense to me. And they're, they're saying that because they figure, well, an Aki is much, much smaller and therefore easier to take care of. It's still a monitor. So you have, you know, kind of a lot of, of a learning curve there. But uh, it's, it's going to be easier for you than just jumping in and grabbing a huge, potentially, uh, or one that will become huge, water monitor, right? So I see what they're saying. You know, get your experience before you just jump into the, to the real difficult uh, care level or, or whatever the case may be. Or, you know, for a real large monitor, the danger level might be what they're talking about. Regardless, I just disagree. I, I strongly disagree. Um, any animal, a living animal that is in your care should be an animal that you truly, truly want, okay? Because more even than the amount of, of reading and studying you do, the amount of passion you have for that animal is going to influence how well you take care of that animal, okay? It is also going to highly determine how much satisfaction you get in taking care of that animal. So if your dream is a water monitor and someone's telling you, okay, first you're going to get a leopard gecko, and then in a couple of years you're going to get a bearded dragon, and then in a couple of years you're going to get an Aki monitor, and then a few years after that you can get a water monitor because then you'll be ready. No, 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 no. Now, if you are recently getting into reptiles, Say the wonderful YouTube algorithm suddenly uh, threw, uh, you know, some reptile channels into your life. And you're like, oh, this is so cool. I didn't realize. And, and you're discovering the world of reptiles. This is a beautiful thing, by the way. It's a wonderful time in people's lives when you, when you realize the wide world of the reptile hobby exists. And you had no idea previously. And then you realize that there's expos and they might be in your city. And it's it just, it's really cool. Regardless, you discover water monitors, you know? And so quickly, you'll, you're going to discover Nerd, Kevin McCurley, right? The, the guru of water monitors. And you're blown away by the morphs and by how friendly and socialized and intelligent his water monitors are. Uh, and it's just incredible. And you set your heart heavily on a... Uh, you know, a sulfur or a black dragon or whatever, a, a water monitor, right? Well, you save up your money and it's going to cost you quite a bit to buy the animal. Um, you're going to probably need to ship the animal and you're going to need an absolutely staggeringly huge enclosure for the animal, a wide array of foods for the animal that are very expensive, um, incredible amount of substrate, some sort of massive water basin that either has incredibly powerful filtration or that you're switching out the water and giving it clean water every single day. Um, I'm talking staggering upfront costs here, right? Um, if you are doing all this properly and you have done all your reading, then and, and connected with some people that have water monitors that you can ask your questions to, it's probably going to be a process of 
many, many months or even a few years before you actually are ready to purchase your water monitor, right? And if by the end of all this research and reaching out to people and maybe even finding kind of a mentor and preparing yourself and saving your money and finding the place in your house for the enclosure and all that's done, if you're still just on fire to get a water monitor, then go get a water monitor, <laughs> right? That animal is clearly the best animal for you. If you believe you have done every conceivable amount of preparation uh, that is needed, you're ready you know the breeder you're going to buy from, uh, then go get a water monitor, right? Um, now, if by the end of all that you've realized, you know, holy cow, I just don't have the money for this, or I don't have the space to keep this animal properly, or I don't want to have a stock of, you know, dozens of rats and quail and all these insects and all this crazy amount of food in my freezer at all times or, or whatever the case may be, but you're still really in love with monitors, maybe you should go get an Aki monitor. But this isn't a case of it's because it's a starter monitor, it's because you've realized that your passion actually fits better with a different species. And that is okay. During the process of... of doing your, your research, I'll call it that, you've realized, oh, maybe I'm not as interested in an animal that could be seven feet long and sever tendons in my hand with one food mistake kind of bite. That Maybe that's not my thing. Or I have little children and I just can't ensure that they're not going to get into the monitor enclosure. No matter what I do, I have these crazy kids and I just, I can't keep them safe or, or whatever the case may be, right? You, you realize and you learn about yourself and you learn about the hobby and about the animals in it and you decide to, to modify what it is that you most want. That's great. That should be encouraged, but not because somebody talked you out of your dream. There's a difference there, right? So why am I holding this snake that to, to, all eyeballs looks like a normal ball python. Is this my dream animal in the reptile world? Well, kinda. <laughs> I love ball pythons, one of my chief joys within the reptile world, but this animal happens to be produced here at the reptile barn, a double het ultramel pied, okay? That combination just electrified me years ago. Before we had any snakes at all, I saw a picture of an ultramel pied, I think on, on World of Ball Pythons, and I was blown away. And I, I thought then, I must have one of these snakes. It is the, one of the most beautiful animals I have ever laid eyes on, and I want to see one and hold one in person, not just drool over pictures on the internet, right? Which I did much of. And to this day, it has been eight years since I saw that picture, I believe. And I finally have my double hats raised up. This is a male. The females are a bit larger. This is the first year they are breeding. And if we are lucky, 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 we could produce here at the reptile barn an ultramel pied ball python. And now, they're nothing like they were back then as far as the hobby's concerned. They're not worth, you know, 10 grand and, and there's only a handful of breeders that have ever produced them. Uh, you know, they've come way down in price. They're far more approachable to the... I could, I could now just go buy one if I wanted to, but I don't. I'm going to continue on the long road that we started many years ago. And this, this guy could be the dad. There's one other male. But, and then there's three females that are all double hets, but hopefully we get lucky and hit one. And man, I promise you, that snake, when we produce it, that ultramel pied, it will not be sold. <laughs> it will stay here at the reptile barn because that, I, you know, there's other more lucrative projects that we're into in ball pythons, but I can honestly say that there is not a snake that I would rather produce and see that animal come out of the egg than an ultrapied. I just, it will be a, a, 
a life event for me, you know, and my family. That We're all very excited about that combo. So, to me, this animal here is very near and dear to me. And all of my animals are. I don't have a single animal in my collection that if all of a sudden the reptile hobby broke and it was impossible to sell snakes, I wouldn't sit looking at my collection and think like, oh, I wish I didn't have all these that I have to take care of now. Of course, as breeders, we have a lot of animals um, and we, we keep more animals than we probably could if we were only hobbyists, you know? The, we, we breed them and we sell them and they make us money and we're able to support our collection because of that. So we keep more than we could otherwise. Um, but every single animal we have was still carefully selected because it was something we were extremely excited about. And we've been told before, oh, you're making a mistake. You should really be more focused in on just two or three main projects and, and getting into these other species is too soon and all these new morphs you bought is too soon you know you need to be more selective and I that's not why I'm into reptiles I'm into reptiles because I love them and I'm going to focus on owning and keeping in in my collection the ones that I love that's why I keep them <laughs> uh, so let me go through a few other things not to tell you what your dream animal is, because that's not my job, but just to throw out some concepts that you may not have thought about before uh, to help you zone in on what might make an animal a dream animal or not a dream animal for you. Um, there is a, a group of hobbyists, uh, a subgroup, who their one of their chief joys is building gorgeous terrariums and enclosures, right? Um, they they ex spare no expense. They research heavily their live plants. They get the perfect lighting, perfect soil substrate, water features, fog. You know, the decorations are just exquisite. And they build, they just look like palaces. And then when they finally introduce that animal into that enclosure, that they've just been dreaming about this combination. That's what gets them going. They love it. It's art to them. These people are artists, right? I would love to have a bunch of just spectacular enclosures, but that's not my chief joy. And um, it is to some people. So that's something to think about. Are you more interested in having a display that is beautiful um, and I'm not knocking that, by the way. That's a great thing to do and to inspire people. You know, when you have a, a social media presence and you're sharing picture after picture and video after video of just unbelievably beautiful enclosures, that is inspiring to a lot of people, including me. For me, my chief joy in keeping reptiles is interacting with them, handling them, right? Feeding them, um... In some cases, socializing them, if it's a species that takes a, lot, a long time to tame down. I love being hands-on with the reptiles. It's okay. The, the way that they feel, the way that they move, the way that they eat, the way that they interact, the tongue flicking, all of it. I just love it. So I am less interested, as beautiful as they are, in venomous species, uh, in you know, really notoriously bitey species, particularly dangerous species. Um, I think croc monitors are one of the most beautiful animals on earth, but I don't know that I'll ever own one because I, I just, they're dangerous, right? And I know they're kind of the rage right now with some of the big keepers, um, but they are dangerous. They just are. You know, uh, they, you get a little, a little love nip from one of those and you could be in the hospital. You could lose a finger, you know, just real easily. And, and I want to be able to interact with my reptiles on a fairly casual basis without, you know, so much in just ridiculous amount of caution, right? And I will always be careful with my animals, of course. Um, but if this guy decides he's having a bad day and he nips me, I'm fine, you know, or even my child is fine. Um, if my 
if I decide that I want a, you know, a, an alligator and it has a bad day, I'm not fine, right? So that influences heavily which animals I keep. So I, even though I, I love you know, the giant species and the, the deadly species, I probably won't keep those. I'll stick to ones that are more manageable, um, that me and my kids can just happily take care of without too much stress, even if they're having a bad day. Um, that, to me, is enjoyable. Some people, uh, it might be something else. There's a lot of things that, that you have to learn about yourself before you can even really know what is my dream species, right? Um, it might be... Here, here's another thing, guys. Longevity. We would probably already have chameleons if they lived longer. Uh, we love them. We love them. Our whole family does. They're incredible. But they really don't live a very long time. And same with frogs. We'll probably keep frogs at some point in the future, but it's not at the top of our list right now because they just don't live a very long time. Uh, many species of them, right? And so that's something to think about. Is that going to bother you? Because it does bother me. I don't like when my animals die, right? Who likes that? And to me, if you're keeping a species that it might only live for five years, as opposed to a python or a boa that could live for 30 or 40 years, that is a big uh, influence on me and how much I'm going to, you know, enjoy keeping this animal. Uh, I'm just... You know, I'm kind of brainstorming here as we go on this video, other things that might affect your enjoyment of your animal. Um, some people really, really stress about how expensive it is going to be, you know, year after year. You know, you might save up and save up and save up for that upfront cost. You know, your big enclosure, your real nice lights and heating and the animal itself but then you'd rather it just be kind of low maintenance after that. Once you've got those big items out of the way, some people really don't want an animal that's going to cost hundreds of dollars a month to feed. Steer away from any crocodilians, right? <laughs> the larger it is in general, it's gonna be hard. Um, what about brumation? Some reptiles really thrive better if you allow them to brumate in the coldest winter months. Well, if this is your beloved pet and it's just disappeared from December, January, and February, that might be a turnoff for some people. These are things that you got to think about. Um, what if it is a species that is notorious for laying slug eggs, almost like a chicken, right? So that might bother some people. You might even have an animal that it, it has a potential for getting egg bound. Uh, if you don't take real good care of it and provide perfect nesting opportunities for it, even though it's never been bred, it's not like these are viable eggs, that might not be something that you enjoy. Uh, what if you really, really love a certain species, but it really ought to be eating insects, and you just cannot stand the thought of constantly going out and buying crickets or roaches or, or mealworms or whatever, and that just really is going to set your teeth on edge, well, maybe that isn't your dream animal. I don't know. Maybe you love that animal so much that it's worth it and you'll overcome that. And it's a minor thing, but that just depends on the person, right? So I have no right or desire to tell you what your dream animal is. And I certainly have no right to sit and tell you, even if this is your dream animal, it's too advanced for you. You should start with something simpler. No, that, that is not my message here. But just be careful that you don't get smitten, you know, you don't get all Twitter-pated, right? Right at the beginning when you see a picture of some new species and decide, I must have that. And you kind of ignore all of the other things that that reptile is going to bring along with it, right? What if it's an animal that really only is ever brought in as a wild-caught animal? And you're going to have to deal with parasites. You're going to have to deal with a very fearful animal. You're going to have to deal with... You know, an animal that's probably going to have scars and stuff, and you wanted it to be this pristine, sleek, perfect-looking animal. Well, that's, that's something you're going to have to think about. Is that going to change your experience in having this animal or not? Um, anyway, that is probably enough. I don't intend for this video to go over every conceivable thing that could come up that would make an animal, 
you know, right for you or not. My intent was more for people to, to take their thinking a step further, to realize that there's a lot more to it than just, what do I think is the most beautiful reptile in the world? That's my dream animal. The beauty of it, while that is important, obviously, um, we want to enjoy looking at our animals, you also have to consider a whole host of other things. Um, so do some, some real deep thinking and consideration of you know the whole lifespan of this animal. What is it going to mean um, long term to you? How willing are you to spend money on veterinary care? What if it gets sick? Um, you know. So anyway, that is just my topic for today. Uh, we have our collection here at the Reptile Barn is really only dream animals, right? We don't, you know, people, I probably get 10 calls a week from local people who are like, hey, do you have bearded dragons? And I'm like, I don't. I don't breed them. I don't keep them. Um, I think bearded dragons are cute. I think they're fun. I think they're wonderful animals. But they're not a dream of ours, right? And so I don't keep them. Uh, our space is limited. Our money is limited. Our time is limited. Uh, we have many limitations at the reptile barn, right? And so I'm not going to take up our time and space and money with bearded dragons uh, or leopard geckos. We get a lot of calls about leopard geckos. Uh, and there's not, that's nothing against them. I think they're spectacular animals. I recommend them to people constantly. I think they're, they're fantastic, right? Um, but that's just not what we keep. Uh, and I'm not going to keep them just because other people think that they're the best, right? I will keep what I think I'm going to enjoy the most. Um, and, you know, obviously it's not just me. Uh, Liz and then Caleb and Yoshimi have just as much say as I do. And that actually helps us because then, you know, it has to be sifted through four different opinions rather than just one. You know, it has to kind of be something that all four of us really, really think is cool and that we're going to enjoy taking care of and learning all the quirks of breeding them. You know, I'll, I'll do one last story before we end this vlog. Uh, we started with ball pythons. Pretty soon after, we got our Dominican boas. Um, we got into some other species. We got uh, some tree monitors, sailfin drag. We, know, we, just, we just came out with our video on all the other species, right? Well, it has been real slow going learning how to perfectly keep these other species to the point where we can be breeding them regularly and getting good results, right? So years ago, we bought Sophie, our female uh, Philippine selfin dragon, right? And we couldn't get anything out of her. Um, we bought a male and he seemed too young. They weren't really interested in breeding or anything. And we went, I don't know, a year with kind of nothing. And then every once in a while she'd lay some dud eggs, but they didn't look good. They weren't fertile or anything. They still hadn't bred. We couldn't get them to breed. Um, finally, maybe another year later, they started breeding. Um, but not well. <laughs> and finally we got what we thought was like one fertile egg. Uh, but the baby died. And so then we started getting, for the next year or so, fertile eggs, but we could not figure out how to hatch those things. It was so disheartening. Um, and then we finally, finally got a clutch where like half of them hatched, I want to say. And then we had a few more die, a few more entire clutches. And then we kind of went back to whatever it was we'd done with that one clutch that we had some success. And we've now had like three clutches in a row do very, very well for us and hatch. And we're kind of zoned in now on this species and we feel like we can do it the whole process right. From an egg to hatching, taking care of the hatchling, having it thrive, having it grow, have adults that like their enclosure, they're well socialized. We figured out how to get them to breed properly. Uh, the nesting requirements so that she'll lay her eggs without any stress. 
removing the eggs, the, the entire life cycle of the sailfin dragon, at least the Philippine sailfin dragon, we feel like we have it down. And it has taken us years and years and years. And death, right? Death of eggs and even little babies. It's been horribly stressful. We are not there yet with our tree monitors, you know? And it's really frustrating because I see so many people having success with breeding their tree monitors, and we are not. And it is sad, but we are not going to give up because these are dream animals, right? We will never give up breeding. If it takes us 30 years, we will keep trying to breed tree monitors. Uh, hopefully it doesn't take us that long. That would be sad. <laughs> but uh, that's my point, though. We are progressing with all these different species. We're learning. I'm constantly talking with people who are more successful than me. You have to just swallow your pride sometimes and call up somebody and say, hey, I need some help, right? Uh, anyway, uh, my point is we would not probably be willing to go through this with bearded dragons. We would have just, after the first six months of no success, our enthusiasm would have waned. We're still feeding these animals. We're still cleaning these animals. We're still paying to for their space and, and their everything. And we just, we wouldn't want to keep doing that to ourselves, right? Now, I'm sure that there are some of these popular species that are popular partly because they're really easy to breed. So I'm not saying that would happen with all these other species. But my point is that you really need to be willing to go through quite a lot if you want to really consider it as your dream species, right? So anyways, I've, I've rambled at you long enough. I hope that I have helped turn your thoughts in a new direction at least. I, I always hope that, that I can introduce a new way of thinking. You can take it or leave it. Absolutely no need for you to change your way of thinking. Um, but just that you now have the opportunity to do so if you wish. Um, and uh, that you can also make a more informed decision about what your dream animal is. Or what your dream animals are. Or what kind of things go into deciding what makes it a dream animal at all. Right? So, uh, this is Ulrich. Again, I, like to, I always like to have an animal on hand that uh, says something about the topic that I'm covering. He is a male double het ultra pied, as I mentioned, produced right here at the reptile barn a couple years ago. You can see those nice pied tracks on him. Um, I mean, he's 100%. He was a, a visual pied to a visual ultra male. But anyway, that is my story, one of our dream animals, and all of these things that incorporate what makes a dream animal to us. And I hope that you enjoyed. Thank you so much for watching. Until next time, we're the Reptile Warriors.